Let's begin with a word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we can come together and consider your word together. Thank you for the privilege of knowing you and knowing you through the word. And I pray as we go into the word of God, the revelation of the things of God, will go deep into our hearts, change us, transform us, bless us, and make us a blessing to the world. We give you all the glory and honor and praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn with me to Romans chapter 1. As you know, we've been studying the book of Romans verse by verse. And uh, this is the seventh week. The first week we talked about the author, second week about the audience, third and fourth week we talked about how Paul was a called apostle. We talked about his calling, the apostleship. And fifth week, we talked about how this gospel is called the gospel of God and why it's the gospel of God. Sixth week, last week, we talked about how this gospel of God was promised by his prophets long before it became effective through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross was promised by his prophets. Now let's read verse 1 and 2. In English it's verse 1 and 2. I'm going to talk about verse 2. In case you're referring to the Tamil Bible, it's verse 4. All right? In translation it comes a little differently. So what we're going to talk about is verse 4. But I'll read only verse 1 and 2 since this is the English service. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So we talked about Paul. We talked about the Roman Christians. We talked about Paul's apostleship. We talked about how this is the gospel of God. We talked about how it's promised through his prophets. And now we're going to talk about, in verse 2, in the Holy Scriptures. In fact, we began to talk about it last week a little bit. I talked about why it's a holy scripture. It's holy because it's not just mere words of men. Men were moved by the Holy Ghost, carried along, borne by the Holy Spirit, given words, and the one who enabled them to speak those words also enabled them to write it down. That's what we call inspiration. And we pointed out to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, that uh, all scripture is given by inspiration. All scripture is inspired. All right. Now being the seventh week, we're going to talk about this phrase, in the holy scriptures, a little more. We just began it last week. We'll talk about it a little more. Why does he bring up this point here? In the King James Version, the authorized version, you'll find verse 2 within brackets. Why would you put something within brackets? That means... It's not the main thing that he's coming to say, but it's not an unimportant thing. He could not leave it out. So he puts it in brackets. That's the way we write, right? We write something. When we put something within brackets, it means that we can't help but say it. We have to say it. It's important. We can't leave it out. But it's not the main point. It's something that is necessary to what we are writing. And that's why he puts it within brackets. Now, the recent translations don't put it within brackets. Nevertheless, it's very important, whether it's in brackets or not in brackets, it's important. That's why Paul brings it up. Now, why does he bring up the matter that it was promised long before by the prophets? And why does he bring up the matter that it is recorded in the Holy Scriptures? We talked about how it was prophesied by the prophets, but... We'll talk about the Holy Scriptures today. This raises the whole doctrine of the Scriptures. You know, this is something that is basic to the Christian faith. In our Bible college, we teach these doctrines. You know, the doctrine of Scripture is taught. And it's good for a Christian people to also, to ordinary people also to know something about what the Bible says about the Bible itself, about the Scripture itself. Because you read the Bible every day and you benefit from it. And we cherish it. And therefore, we need to know uh, something about it. What is written here is in condensed form. See, these are teachings that have been given in the church. If you 
I've often imagined what the first century preaching and teaching would have been like. And I can very well tell you what it was like. Something about the scriptures themselves was taught, I believe, because when you read the Gospels, when you read the epistles, you cannot but notice how much it emphasizes the fact that the Old Testament scriptures are the word of God, the things have been prophesied long before it has been revealed and so on. And we saw a few weeks ago when we talked about Paul's apostleship, how him and the other apostles were uniquely chosen by God. They are eyewitnesses to the risen Christ, but not only to that, they are unique. That kind of apostleship is not there today. People call themselves apostles today. There's a lot of preachers put the title apostle in front of them. They may be apostles in one way. That is, they take the gospel to unreached areas and they can call themselves apostles in that way. But nobody can be apostle like these apostles, like Peter, Paul, John, and all these fellows. Nobody can be apostles like this because in order to be apostles like that, you have to be an eyewitness of the risen Lord and that you have to be uniquely chosen and commissioned to carry the gospel and particularly to write the gospel. Even the New Testament scriptures, the Old Testament is prophetic scriptures, Moses and prophets, they were all inspired by God to do that. In the New Testament, all the writings are by the apostles or by someone who was under the influence of that apostle. They're writing the apostolic material, what the apostles have said. The material comes from the apostles, therefore it carries authority. All right, we saw that already. So we're going to talk about why he cares to mention this thing in the Holy Scriptures. Why is Paul so bent on that? There are three things, three questions we're going to ask and answer right here. One is, we know that this gospel concerning God's Son and what he did for us, is what provided us the salvation, but it was promised long before by the prophets and written in the scriptures, long before. Centuries ago, it was promised and written in the scriptures. Now, this raises the question of why God did it this way. Why did God have to reveal it so long ago and wait for centuries and centuries and centuries? Like for example, Genesis 3.15 happened when? In the Garden of Eden, where he says, I'll put enmity between your seed and her seed. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. That was way back in the Garden of Eden. Why then did God have to wait all this time, centuries and centuries, thousands of years, to bring it to pass? Why did God act this way? Why the delay? Why the long interval between the fall of man in the Garden of Eden and the coming of the Son of God for redemption and salvation. Why all this Old Testament history? So that the one who wrote the book of Hebrews in the very first verse of that epistle, he talks about how God in the old times spoke in various manners, through various ways, and so on, through the prophets, angels, and so on, how God spoke through various manners, through various ways. Now, if God wanted the day that Adam and Eve sinned, that particular day, that day itself, he could have brought about salvation. Don't you think so? What is it that has caused him to wait this long, and that to so many thousands of years? There is a sense in which we can only attempt to answer such a question because there's no clear answer. But we can deduce answer, we can come up with answers looking at the whole thing of what is happening and understanding God and his ways. So I'm going to here suggest some answers that have been suggested by so many great Bible teachers all through history. Why this delay? Why this interval between the fall and the redemption actually happening through Jesus Christ? The first reason is that it's God's way of revealing the depth of sin. It is God's way of teaching us what sin really is. A lot of people think that sin is a light act of disobedience, you know. I think I was sharing in Friday night prayer and 
I've been teaching a, a doctrine of sin also in the Bible college, so I've been into this thing for some time now. A lot of people don't even use the word sin anymore. They say it's a mistake. It's an imperfection. It's a weakness. A lot of Christians have begun to use that. The devil has really got that, got our vocabulary messed up so that he can mess up our thinking. So we don't call it sin because it sounds so harsh and so terrible, so we have shifted to other words, you know. It's a diversionary tactic by the devil, I think. Sin is not a weakness. Sin is not a mistake. Sin is not just a small act of disobedience. It is a profound disease of the soul of men, which leads to terrible and awful consequences. That's what the Bible teaches. If you look at the doctrine of sin in the, as taught in the Bible, it's a profound disease of the spirit and the soul of man. The terrible thing about sin is that it blinds us to the truth of God. That's the main thing about sin. It blinds you so that you do not see the truth about God, that you don't understand the things of God. You understand science, you understand mathematics, you understand physics. You can even make rockets to go to the moon and achieve great things scientifically and so on. The thing that you can't see Being so intelligent, so clever, the thing that you cannot see is the things of God. That's what you cannot understand. That's the terrible thing about sin. <laughs> you know, when you understand this, only you understand how horrible sin is. It cuts you from God. It makes you go and live without God. It causes you to take the wrong path, walk away from God. That's the horrible thing about sin. And Jesus, remember, he argued with the Jews like this. These men claimed to be great experts in the Old Testament. They said, well, we read the Old Testament and we, you know, they thought they are great experts in the law. They considered themselves authorities on the law of Moses. And Jesus says to them, go back and read them, he said. You take your pride in Moses and you say that it is your knowledge of Moses and his writings that will give you salvation. You believe that the law will somehow save you, that if you do what the law says, you'll have salvation. Go and read it. Because this Moses, who you think is so great, was writing about me. He actually explicitly stated, saying, God will raise for you a prophet like unto me. Listen to him and obey him, he said. <laughs> he was pointing to me. The whole point of his writing was he was writing about me. Paul speaks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 also. Have you read 2 Corinthians 3? A very interesting, but I don't have the time to read all of that, but let me just take you there just for a moment. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, a very powerful chapter, talks about the new covenant and the old covenant and so on, and what the problem was for the Jews. Paul says, the problem with the Jews is, he says in verse 15, even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. <laughs> Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. <laughs> when Moses is read, a veil is there in their heart. They cannot accept the truth. They cannot see the truth. They cannot understand the things of God. Reading of Moses is fine, but they don't understand it. What's the use of reading it? They don't see Christ there. Paul, for so many years, read it, never saw Christ there. In fact, he was going around killing Christians. He never saw Christ there. He never saw the point. But then when he became a preacher, he was whole time preaching about how this Jesus is the Christ. This one whom I was persecuting, he is the Christ. He saw his veil was moved, removed. When he turned to Christ, the veil was removed. All of a sudden, his eyes could now see. So I say to you, when you turn to the gospel, when you believe in Christ, when you're enabled by the Holy Spirit and drawn by the Holy Spirit to the gospel, and you turn to Christ in faith, one of the most beautiful things that happened to a sinner is that now, He has the ability to understand the things of God. 
That's the main thing that was lacking before. He cannot understand the things of God. Now he can see. Now he sees the whole point. So the Jews, with all their record of God's revelation given to them concerning God and salvation, the whole salvation story is explained there in the Old Testament. They were God's chosen people, but they could not see because of the blindness that was there as a result of sin. You find the same effect, not only the blindness, I'm just mentioning that as the primary thing, not only the blindness, that effect of sin can be seen in many other areas, such as the terrible degradation that has happened in the world today and the degradation to which humanity has sunk today. How low can they become? You read chapter one of Romans, the later part, we'll come to it, amazing part, from verse 18 onwards. How sin has brought them so low. I mean, they've hit rock bottom because of sin. The degradation of humanity. That's the result of sin. First, it cuts you off from God. You can't see who God is, what God is all about. Cannot understand the things of God. Then you become so low having lost the knowledge of God, your state becomes pathetic. You know. That's what sin does. See, that is why God delayed the whole thing because otherwise man would have said, why did you hurry up and send Jesus? Just, you should have waited. We could have set ourselves right. Man is full of pride, you see. He thinks he can do everything. I can go to the moon, so can I not do this? Can I not figure out a way of salvation? Can I not figure out a way to get out of this sinfulness and sin and all that? I would have figured it out. Just give me a few days. So God said, not a few days. I'll give you a few thousand years. Take it. You try it. The first thing is, he wanted man to see what sin is there. Today we teach the doctrine of sin. Because God waited all these thousands of years, we understand sin more than if he had not waited. Today we understand sin in all of its power, in all of its pollution, perversion, corruption. We understand it in every aspect of sin because thousands of years have gone by since man fell to the time that Jesus came and provided salvation. So we can see the outworking of sin, how it works inside and how it works outside on the society. Today we understand sin. Today we preach about sin and people who sit there squirm, really, when you preach about sin because they know that's reality. They know that's what sin does. Every one of us can remember a time when we could not see the truth about God, how we lived in our own way, how we were blind to the truth. And we can see the time when our eyes were open, we came to Christ, right? Secondly, another reason is God waited so long because God has finally proved by sending Jesus so late, finally proved to mankind that any attempt on man's part to save himself is futile and doomed to fail. Any attempt on man's part to save himself will be futile and doomed to fail. God didn't have to say it to man. He has proven it to man. If God said it, man would have laughed at it. They said, oh, you should have waited. You should have waited. You should wait and see. We'll do it. We can save ourselves. But God gave thousands of years, and by giving thousands of years, he proved to man that it's futile. He'll never succeed in saving himself. Look at what happened. Look at the great civilizations that rose up. Some of them are mentioned in the Bible itself, the Babylonian, the Egyptian, and all those... Uh, Assyrian and uh, Greek, uh, Roman, all these great empires and kingdoms and civilizations that rose up. People like the Greeks, they were so into intellectualism, philosophy and all that, searching for answers, searching for answers of why things are the way they are, and giving explanations for it. But the more they searched, the more they failed. They let God just watching. Let Socrates search, let Plato search, let Aristotle search, 
that all these great philosophers, they are still the greatest. Anybody that studies philosophy, they have to study them only today. There has never been greater philosophers than them. God allowed the greatest philosophers that could ever arise from human societies to rise up, think as hard as they could, and search for ways as hard as they could, and fail miserably, and then send Jesus. That's why Galatians 4.4 says, when the fullness of time came. See, the timing was fantastic. <laughs> timing in God's wisdom is amazing. The timing had many elements, you know. The gospel came when it came. And one great preacher said, the timing has to do with a lot of things. One is, all philosophy failed. All philosophers failed. The other is, roads were laid by Romans, going everywhere to the, every corner of the world. Now when Jesus said, preach the gospel to all creatures, this is possible literally now. So timing had many elements. And one of the elements is that people can themselves see that no human effort no human endeavor can ever save mankind from their sin. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1.21, a very powerful verse, Paul puts it like this. The world through wisdom did not know God. Wow. In other words, literally, if you put it in simple English, the world through philosophy and philosophers did not know God. They searched through philosophy and philosophers, did not know God. In Romans 8, 3, in Romans chapter 8, and when we come to it, we'll study it. It's a very powerful verse in Romans chapter 8. And verse 3, he says it, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Look at that. It was weak through the flesh, it says. See, God not only waited for all the philosophers to come and all the thinking to happen, and every human effort and endeavor to take place in order to save man and let it miserably fail. God waited until such time. But then God also did another thing. He gave his own law. Because man would say, if you had only told us how to live, we would have lived the way you told us to live. If you had only taught us live like this, if you had just given us the rules, we would have gone by the rules so easy. That's why when he gave the Ten Commandments, if you read it in Exodus 20, he gave the Ten Commandments. God pointedly says, you do this and you will live, he said. Not because they can do this and live. He says, let's see you do this. If you do this, you'll live. That means you can never do it. If you depend on the law, you'll die, you'll perish. God gave the law because he knew very well they would have said, if you had given us the way to live, we would have lived and shown it to you. And Paul says how the law failed to save them. Law was never meant to save them. It was meant to point to their sin, to point to the fact that they are sinners. So Paul says it like this, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. They could not keep the law because the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. See, there is a carnal side of us. There is sinful nature that will never allow you to do what the law of God says. You'll fail always. The law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. What the law could not do, God did it by sending his son. What a powerful verse. <laughs> he had to first prove that the law could not do it. So he sent the law so that they find out that they couldn't do it. Then he sent his son. Then only the son's value will be realized. Thirdly, third reason is that perhaps God did this in order to show his lordship overall, to show his absolute control, to show his final authority, that he is in control. See, if you look at Old Testament history, if you look at Old Testament, read Old Testament, it finally comes down to this. It can all be divided into two sections. One is, God's actions, where God acts, and the other is God's permissions. There are times when God acts, such as the flood. God sent the flood, such as the crossing of the Red Sea. Amazing action happening. Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. Amazing act of God's judgment. 
God coming down on a sinful humanity, crossing the Red Sea, entering Canaan, the waters of Jordan being divided. How many times amazingly God intervenes and acts. These are God's actions. But then there are long periods of time when God seemed to be doing nothing. Where people actually said, where is your God? Some kings that were challenging the Israelites said, hear about the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar, what he said. Let's see what your God will do. <laughs> will your God save you? Let's see what, where is your God was the question. Because they couldn't see. They are captives in Babylon. And the world was laughing at them. Where is your God? You mean to say just because God didn't show up there and deliver them, God is not there? And God is working even through that captivity. We saw that on New Year's Day, I preached the sermon on that. God was very much there. God was in fact speaking to them through prophet Jeremiah, what exactly to do. <laughs> when you think that God is not there, that is when he's fully active, he's there. But the world doesn't see it. People of God sometimes don't see it. So there were long periods of time when God seemed to be doing nothing and permitted all kinds of things to happen. So that people said, where is your God? This tremendous length of time between the fall and the coming of Jesus demonstrated that God is in complete control. He's not moved by anything. He does things according to his program. He's got a mind of his own. He's got a will. He's got a plan. He's all wise. He knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what he can do, how powerful he is. So he's not intimidated by the words of the king saying, what can your God do and all that. No, 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 no. He's letting it happen. He's permitting. Sometimes acting, sometimes permitting. That's what the Old Testament history reveals to us. Fourthly, and this is the ultimate reason, I would say, and this reason may sound a little strange. The ultimate reason for delay in sending Jesus after the fall, maybe that the devil should be silenced. Devil must be silenced. Why? Because devil accuses not only us, he keeps accusing God also. He says, God has acted unfairly. Remember, he came to the Garden of Eden, talked to Eve. In an accusing tone, alleging that God may not be all that right, you know. Maybe he's withheld some blessings from you. Did God say that you shall not eat of any fruit of the, of any of the trees of the garden? That's the way he asked. He's alleging that God may be a very mean God. You know, he put all these trees and all the fruits are there and he doesn't want you to eat of anything, you know. So God has given mankind full opportunity to save itself to put its world in order, to emancipate itself. He has blessed them many times in spite of their sins. He chose these people, he gave the law, still nothing worked. He allowed all these efforts and endeavors to go on and allowed it to fail, permitted it to fail. And ultimately, now the devil's mouth is shut. He is silenced. He cannot say that God was unfair. God is just, and there is not a word that can be said against him. So that's why the delay. Think about that. When you read the whole Bible, this is what you can come up with, maybe, as the answers to the delay. Secondly, the question is, why is he so interested in adding the statement within the brackets in the Holy Scriptures? Why do you think he does this? Why did he feel he must do this? That he must always do this? Because he not only does it here, he does it in Romans itself in so many places. For example, chapter 3, verse 21. In Romans chapter 3 and verse 21, look at it just for a moment. That is also another powerful verse. It says, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. He's talking about Justification by faith. That is, without doing any work, a person is saved by the work of Jesus. The righteousness of God. 
not your righteousness but god is giving his righteousness through what jesus did on the cross he becomes sin you become righteous the righteousness of god apart from the law is revealed without the help of the law you become righteous you become righteous because god gives you righteousness that's the gospel now listen but now the righteousness of god apart from the law is revealed being witnessed look at this there also he interjects it being witnessed by the law and the prophets ah see he's always interested in mentioning that it's in the old testament being witnessed by the law and the prophets he says and chapter 16 he again says that the last chapter let's read from 25 now to him who's able is the benediction he gives now to him who's able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of jesus christ according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began but now made manifest now he has explained the gospel and look at the benediction he gives but now made manifest the gospel is now made manifest kept secret since the world began but now been revealed but kept secret now revealed but then he says now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations once again he cannot keep away from this he's again and again saying, by prophetic scriptures made known to all nations according to the commandment of the everlasting god for obedience to the faith to god alone wise be glory through jesus christ forever amen so there he is he seems very anxious that these people should see the vital importance or significance of the position of scriptures in these matters right now you may feel like saying what you know he wants to say actually in chapter 1 we read verses 1 and 2 it's all right that he says he is a bond servant it's all right he says that he's called to be an apostle he's all right he says that he's separated to the gospel of god then he can go straight away to concerning christ because he just wants to say i'm called to be an apostle separated to the gospel of god which is concerning his son jesus christ why does he put it in brackets these things why does he add these statements in parentheses why is this is so important this was his method and look at acts chapter 17 this is his method this is the way he preaches and preachers can learn a lot from it this is the way he preaches he's got exactly the idea of what he's going to say he wants to say that jesus is lord he is the savior he has come to save us he is the son of god how to say it he finds the scriptures a great support look at chapter 17 verse 1 to 3 now when they had passed through amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the jews then paul as his custom was went in to them for three sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures ah what did he do for three sabbaths he went in in the synagogue and reasoned with them from the scriptures no look at it next verse explaining and demonstrating that christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying this jesus whom i preach to you is the christ he reasoned with them from the scriptures he did not tell them stories hello preaching is not telling one story after another stories are to support what we are saying to explain what we are saying eh? charles spurgeon said stories and illustrations are like windows in a house you keep windows here and there to let the light in let air in and so on but if you build a house full of windows all you got to tell is stories you know somebody throw a stone the whole house will come down you know your house cannot be built with all windows few windows are necessary to keep things fresh so he didn't tell them stories he didn't tell them about himself stories about where he went what he did and all that he reasoned with them from the scriptures that's what true preaching is all about you know nowadays people can't even judge what is true preaching you know what is true preaching opening the scripture reading the scripture 
reasoning with the people based on the scripture explaining to them demonstrating to them who jesus is what he has come to do what he has done and what we become as a result of it that's all that's what preaching is you see the method he reasoned with them from the scriptures he reasoned what explaining and demonstrating to them that the christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying that this is the jesus who i preach to you you see his method the scriptures the old testament scriptures is all that he had and that was his method that was his source moses and the prophets law and the prophets whatever you want to call it he took the scriptures and reasoned with them explaining the scriptures demonstrating the scriptures 1 corinthians 15 1 to 4 is another wonderful passage that tells us how important scripture was to him you know sometimes preachers end up using scriptures like a coat hanger you know something to hang what they say they want to find a nice verse eh so that they can hang all that they want to say on that one verse but that verse is not saying that at all you know that is not what scriptures are for look at chapter 15 1 corinthians 15 1 to 4 moreover brethren i declare to you the gospel which i preach to you which also you received in which you stand by which also you are saved if you hold fast that word which i preached to you unless you believed in vain for i delivered to you first of all that which i also received that christ died for our sins according to the scriptures ah again look at that this comes everywhere christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried he means to say according to the scriptures even though he doesn't say it he means according to the scriptures and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures he says it again why would he keep dragging on like this why not simply tell us about christ why does he have to go to old testament scriptures and even go to great lengths to show that it, it's according to the scriptures is it not enough to say that jesus died for our sins no he says it's according to the scriptures it's an age old plan of god from before the beginning of the world god has planned it and he has executed it today the gospel i'm preaching to you is not some good news made up by some man now it was something that was planned and purposed by god executed by god by sending his own son that's the gospel second timothy 3:15 again is there another wonderful verse we read last week is telling timothy from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in christ he's talking about how timothy knows the old testament scriptures because he was raised up with the teaching of the scriptures and that old testament scriptures if he understood it it will lead him to salvation through jesus christ he says <laughs> a lot of people think that jesus is not there in the old testament they think that new testament is what brings jesus no the old testament is fully about jesus if you read that you will become saved if you understood that you will see jesus it will make you wise unto salvation so the apostle keeps on doing what he began doing in the very beginning of the letter keeps on doing it throughout the book of romans keeps on doing it when he goes to the other epistles writing to others he's always wanting to show that it's in the scriptures why does he do it here are some reasons let me quickly point out some reasons he did it because he is anxious to prove to them that this gospel which he has preached and which he was preaching was not something new or strange it is not something that is a complete departure from what they have learned in the past it is not something altogether new particularly the jews were very concerned that some strange guy is going around He has embraced a new cult, you know, teaching something new about this Jesus who is risen from the dead, they claim. You know, they are suspicious about this whole gospel. They think that Paul made it up. Even today there are people that say Paul is the inventor of Christianity and founder of Christianity, they say. That Paul is the one who made Jesus God. <laughs> no. There are people who think like that and there are people that thought like that in the, back in the first century. 
when he was going around preaching Christ, they said, this is something strange, new, this is not in the Bible. He says, who said, this is in the Bible? Let me show you from Genesis to Malachi, I'll show you. It's in the prophets, it's in Moses, it's in the prophets, it's in the Psalms, it's everywhere. The whole point was that this was a continuation of what God was already doing. They were suspicious yeah, about the whole message of Jesus. Yeah. Because Paul was preaching Christ and Jesus Christ was not a Pharisee, you know. Paul was a Pharisee, Jesus was not a Pharisee. He never learned anything from the teachers of the law there. So they're saying, how could he become so great? How come this man who's a Pharisee so learned preaching about somebody who never went to school, never studied anything, and he's teaching his teachings? <laughs> They're suspicious. So Paul wants to assure them this was a continuation of what God had already been doing. Okay. From the Garden of Eden, this was promised. It was foretold by many prophets, including Moses. And now, the fulfillment has come in and through Jesus Christ. So Paul is using the same method he's always used. And uh, he's trying to show that the method of salvation that this gospel presents is the same, it's not a different method now. Salvation through Jesus Christ is not through some other method. See, a lot of fellows, you know, they, in talking about the Old Testament and the New Testament, you got to be very careful. There is some difference, but if you can't go overboard, you know, you can't make it altogether different, you know. You got to be very careful when you talk about the difference between the Old and the New Testament. We'll deal with that as we go in our studies of Romans. In many places, this matter will come up. You got to be very careful with dealing with the difference. One of the things that they say is, they say the Old Testament method of salvation was through the law. In the New Testament, it is through faith in Jesus. Wrong. Law was never given to save. The Old Testament method was not law. The Old Testament method of salvation was by grace only. That is why the sacrifices were given. Not only was the law given side by side, the sacrifices were given. Because by law, if they come, they'll fail. They will not receive salvation. By grace, if they come, by the substitutionary sacrifice of a Lamb of God, if they come, they will be accepted. That's grace. So grace teaching is in the Old Testament. Grace came in a person in Jesus Christ in the New Testament, but grace is what is taught in the Old Testament, thoroughly taught in the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 4, for example, just quick example, Romans chapter 4, when we come to it, we'll deal with it. Paul uses two examples to show, you know, how in the Old Testament salvation happened. He says, how was Abraham saved? By his works of the law? By his deeds, works, or by faith? He said, if it's by faith, then it must be by grace. If it's not by grace, you cannot be saved by faith. Grace and faith go together. If you say by faith, that means it is by grace, therefore it's by faith, right? Understand that. So he says, how did he get saved? By faith or by the works? He says, by faith. Abraham came before the law. Moses hadn't even given the law yet. How could he be saved by law? He was saved by faith. He believed God and it was counted unto him as righteousness. Genesis 15 verse 6. He believed and God counted him as righteous. That's it. Finished. God promised him seeds like the stars of the sky. He believed God counted him righteous. And then he uses another example. David is a man who was born after the law was given, who was born under the law, lived under the law, practiced the law and all that. And that man says, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven, whose transgressions are erased. In 32nd Psalm, he quotes the 32nd Psalm and says, David said that. David didn't say, bless God, I was able to keep all the Ten Commandments so I can be saved. No, he knew very well that if he came by the law, he'll die, that's all. Death sentence, because he killed a fellow. That's what the law said. There is no forgiveness under the law for a murder. He came by grace, he came by faith, 
and he knows the blessedness of being forgiven of your sins forgiven of your transgressions you were a terrible sinner and he says oh how blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven so he did it because he was anxious to prove to them that the gospel is not something altogether new but it's altogether old <laughs> it was always there and he proves it by the scriptures proves it through the old testament scripture that's why he needs the old testament scriptures that's why he says it's prophesied and recorded in the scriptures thank god it's recorded if they prophesied and died nothing would be here thank god it's recorded you say prophesied and written down the second reason is second reason why he says in the holy scriptures prophesied and recorded in the holy scriptures it was the apostles way of establishing two main points of his preaching the two main points of his preaching as we read in acts 17:3 when he went to thessalonica and preached the two main points were this why did he preach what is the subject matter of his preaching it was to explain and demonstrate that jesus must first suffer and die and then be raised it says that in verse 3 acts chapter 17 he must prove that the messiah must suffer and die and then must be raised secondly then he must state that this is the christ that did that that this jesus which he preached is the christ who came and suffered and died and rose again so he must demonstrate and explain that the messiah must suffer and die first and then show that that messiah is none else other than this jesus born in bethlehem through the womb of mary this carpenter's son he's that messiah these are the two main points of his preaching the jews believed that their messiah would come and he'll be a very great military personality political personality he will come and uh, he will be the founder of a great new kingdom and then he will found a big army and he will take the romans to task and he will defeat them and drive them away and give them back everything that god gave them their land and their rights and their privilege set them free and make them wonderful blessed people once again that's what they thought was expecting a military personality expecting a political leader to them the idea that this carpenter is the messiah the carpenter's son is the messiah one born in bethlehem is the messiah raised in nazareth is the messiah is an unutterable nonsense you know it's something that they didn't want to believe it's nonsense to their ears so the apostle was keen on proving that this is the messiah and keen on proving that he must first suffer and die they couldn't understand the suffering messiah they understood a conquering messiah a hero messiah a messiah who will come with a sword and come on a horse and do away with all these bad elements you know they couldn't understand a suffering messiah who will hang on a cross beaten spit upon laughed up laughed at they could not understand how he could be a messiah he had to prove that he must suffer and die and then be raised again that's why he says the jews are seeking for miracles the greeks are seeking for wisdom but i preach christ crucified why is he preaching christ crucified he's preaching christ crucified because he's got to first show that he must die suffer and die and be raised again all right so once he proves that then the second step is a natural next step that jesus who rose again now is that messiah and he is lord and so on and that all the promises as said in second corinthians 120 are in him ye and in him amen to the glory of god the father that means you know what that means all the promises made in the old testament full of promises about this coming messiah the futuristic promises all the prophetic promises of god from genesis to malachi all the prophets including moses everyone has prophesied and all those promises are yea in him and amen in him it's all come to fulfillment 
in this one person and what he did, all the promises of God have been fulfilled in and through him. Here is the fulfillment, once and forever, in this one person. Fulfillment of the entire Old Testament. That's what he means. All right? Well, the third one, I will leave it for a later time because when we come to another subject, I'll deal with it because that'll be too involved a subject. All right? So I will not touch it. All right. So first, we consider this question. The question of why the delay, so much delay between the fall and the coming of Jesus. Secondly, we considered why does he care to mention this, that it's recorded in the scriptures. Why is this is so important? We considered and gave some reasons, two reasons basically today. Next, we come to the third one. The third question is, What are the lessons here for us concerning the scriptures? We talk so much about scriptures, the importance of scriptures, right? And what is the lesson for us? There are certain things that we must take a firm grasp of and we can never lose hold of, you know, we can never let it go. As Christians, as people belonging to this church and wherever you are listening today, whichever church you belong to, as a Christian person who believes in the Bible, there are certain things you must take a firm grasp of. You must hold on to and never let go. Let me tell you what are they. Several things. The Bible, first of all, is complete. What do I mean by that? I'm talking about verse 2 in uh, Romans chapter 1. We talked about uh, how it's the Word of God and it's inspired. You know, it's recorded in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, last week I talked about how it's inspired. It's written by men who were moved by the Holy Ghost, by his holy prophets. Yeah. And uh, that is referring to the Old Testament scriptures, right? The prophetic scriptures is the Old Testament scriptures. Then about the New Testament, we talked about it when we talked about the apostolic calling, how the apostles were the ones behind the New Testament. All right? So the New Testament has apostolic authority. That is why the Bible says that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, apostles in the New Testament, and prophets in the Old Testament. These people have spoken, taught, and it's recorded. These are the things that are inspired. These are the things that carry authority. And uh, with the Old Testament and New Testament together, therefore, we have a Bible that is complete. Okay. This is a complete revelation of what God has to say to us concerning man, his sin, God's love for us, is salvation for us. Everything that we need to know concerning these things is given here in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. If everything that we need to know is authoritatively given, inspired by the Holy Spirit, moved, Holy Spirit moved on people and they wrote it, and the Holy Spirit made sure that it is written without error, then we must rely on this. It leads me to say this, that we must never add to this revelation. If this is complete, I said the Bible is complete. If this is complete, we must never add to this revelation. Why do I say that? Because there are those who believe in the world today that there are people who succeed the apostles, who are direct successors of the apostles, right? I talked about it when we talked about the apostleship of Paul. So they claim, well, Peter was there as the first head of the church, and then there was this man, then there was the other man, and so on. And they go down the line, apostolic succession, they call it, in the church leadership. They claim to be direct descendants of the original apostles. And therefore, they claim to have apostolic authority and they've introduced some doctrines also. After the Bible was written, after we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, the inspired word of God, they came up with some strange doctrines. And uh, you say, well, it's not in the Bible. They say, it's not in the Bible, but we are successors of Peter. We are successors of the original apostles. 
So just as it was granted to them, it is granted to us. So they introduced some doctrines in the Christian church and uh, those things have led people in the wrong way. Let me just stop it at that, you know, and not go any further. We'll come to it later on. Let me just mention the doctrine maybe. One is the doctrine that says that Mary in her birth itself was free from original sin, that she was without sin. She was born without original sin. We are all born in sin, but Mary was not. Otherwise, how could she bear the Holy Son of God in her womb? You know, she is free from original sin, they said. Another is a doctrine of assumption, which says that when she reached a certain age, she was directly taken into heaven, body and soul, so that she can enter into glory that God had for her as the mother of our Lord, you know. And our position is that we respect Mary. We think of Mary as a wonderful person. And uh, we, I preached about the Magnificat and all that, you know, we, we appreciate her faith, especially I'm thrilled by her faith. She said to the angel, when Zechariah couldn't believe what the angel told him, she believed, a peasant girl believed and said, may it be unto me according to your word. I have preached so much on that. So we appreciate Mary, respect Mary very much. But we believe that uh, she is not any more special than any one of us. That God used her to bring Jesus into this world. In that way she was special. But to say that, that she was without sin is going overboard, I think. So very clearly is going overboard. And this doctrine of assumption that says that she was just taken up and body and soul and entered into glory also is not something that is found in the scripture at all. They claim authority like the apostles. They say God revealed it to us much later, many centuries later, these things came about. All right, let's leave it at that. Secondly, so the Bible is complete. Secondly, the Bible is authoritative. It is our only rule and standard. All right. What do I mean? It means that I must not believe anything unless it is either plainly stated in the scripture or else legitimately deduced from it. If I read it plainly in the scripture or like Paul did, he was reasoning in the scriptures, taking the scriptures he was reasoning and showing that it's true. If it doesn't come that way, that is not to be accepted. Thirdly, the Bible is one. It consists of the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's only one book. <laughs> there are some people that are saying it's a library of books, 66 books. It's like a library. <laughs> no. Wrong. Some people say it's two books, Old Testament and the New Testament. No, wrong. It's one book, one message, one savior, one method of salvation. It is no different. Old Testament and New Testament, the method of salvation, the savior is not different at all. It's not different at all. You should not mess up on that, you know. The method of salvation is the same. The savior is the same. The way of salvation is the same. So the message is basically the same. Fourthly, Old Testament, therefore, now I'm talking only about the Old Testament. Old Testament, therefore, is obviously essential. I say this because especially these days, <laughs> these days everybody's got a voice, you know. They can publish anything now. So before they used to write and publish and nobody read that. Now they talk. Sometimes they just talk all kinds of things, you know. So you'll hear a lot of people talking about Oh, that's Old Testament. Oh, he's preaching only from the Old Testament. Oh, he's pre what did Paul preach from? He preached only from the Old Testament. Hello? Why is Old Testament any lesser to you than the New Testament? It's one book. That's why the one book concept is very important. You should not even look at it as two books. It's one book, one message, one savior, one method of salvation. If you don't think like that, then you will believe the errors of these fellows that do not realize it and divert people by saying, that's Old Testament. Anything you take, that's Old Testament. And this is New Testament, you know. What do you mean Old Testament? Long back, even in the very first century, there were certain people that believed that uh, 
they can put away the old testament because that has to do with the jews not necessary for us they believe that error see any error you see today is a old error comes again and again seasonal like mango comes every year during summer these errors come now and then and go <laughs> i've seen in my long experience now i've got some experience now so i've been as a preacher now almost 40 years and i've seen all these errors come and go seasonally there's a season for all of them they thought old testament for the jews and the new testament is for today <laughs> how you cannot be more wrong than that why do i say this do you read the old testament regularly and how do you read the old testament so some people say well when you read the old testament you must only read it devotionally just read the psalms and proverbs and things like that read to know some history or something like that don't take it too seriously you know that's not teaching any doctrine or anything like that just devotionally just like psalms reading you know just to spend some time reading some nice stuff poetry nice advice or something like that not for serious doctrine don't go into old testament they say wrong there is doctrinal revelation in the old testament that we need today we must read it the same way as we read the new testament we must realize that it's part of the revelation exactly in the same way as the old new testament you must do serious reading of the old testament and serious preaching of the old testament i am never ashamed to preach from the old testament and i'll tell you reason why i'm so thrilled about the old testament fifthly our interpretation of the new testament must never contradict the old testament i listen to this this is one reason why you cannot put away the old testament because your interpretation of the new testament must never contradict the old testament you can actually check whether you are in- doing the interpretation right or wrong by checking to see what the old testament teaching is all about for example one example take the point of the doctrine of the atonement the doctrine concerning the death of christ what it means the death of jesus is very popular these days to say that the idea of substitutionary atonement is wrong that jesus died for us taking our place in our place that is no 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 a loving god how could he have done that how could he have killed his own son they've got some messed up logic you know how could he kill his own son what kind of a god kill puts his own son on the cross and kills him so no substitutionary atonement how can god punish sin the death that happened on to jesus on the cross is our death he carried our death the wages of sin is death he took it they say no it can ha- never happen because god is a god of love and the old testament people didn't have a full revelation of god's love therefore they talked about substitution they talked about punishment and all that in the new testament it is not there you could not be more wrong than this they you ask them what what about the cross why did it happen they say it happened so that it can show to the world that god forgives even the cruel most cruel sinners most cruel injustice as god will forgive other than that nothing was happening look at the son of god the holy son of god they crucified him but god put up with it and forgave that that's the message they say it was not happening because god put him there the bible says in romans chapter 8 and verse 32 i think that for even though he was the son he was the god's son god did not spare him but delivered him for us all god delivered jesus to die on the cross and that's why jesus was crying out saying my god my god why hast thou forsaken me god put jesus on the cross and he died there because of god's will why someone had to take our place it's a concept of the lamb of god that takes the sin of the world he took our sin he became the lamb that died it was the sacrifice punishment demanded a sacrifice without the shedding of blood there is no sin so they got rid of the idea of expiation the punishment the sacrifice all of that is gone they say it only shows the love of god how god forgives the most cruel sins of people 
But the Old Testament teaching is sacrifice. Look at all the sacrifice in the Old Testament. Do you think they were playing with animals? Killing them, shedding their blood, sprinkling it everywhere and all that? You think they were in vain bringing morning sacrifice, evening sacrifice? You think the sin offering was in vain? The burnt offering was in vain? All the offerings and things were in vain? You think all the Old Testament teaching has nothing to do with substitutionary sacrifice? See, all these people that try to make Old Testament less important are the people that will say substitutionary atonement is not right. If you understand the Old Testament, you will never say substitutionary atonement is not right. You will interpret the New Testament properly in light of what the Old Testament teaches. That's why I'm using that example. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 4, we already read, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Not simply died, according to the scriptures. He died for our sins. He's referring to Old Testament scriptures. He died for our sins according to the scriptures. The Old Testament teaches it. If you read the Old Testament, you'll know. The Lamb of God that was killed, the Lamb that was killed on the Day of Atonement signified Jesus. The scapegoat signified Jesus. That's why John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He's going to take away and put away from us the sin of the world. So you cannot interpret the New Testament in a way that goes against the Old Testament. Sixthly, the New Testament does fulfill the Old Testament. Here's a very important and practical point. If you don't remember this, your view of salvation might go wrong. The New Testament fulfills the Old Testament. Eh? There are some views of salvation that people have. You know, They say that uh, you can get saved, yet not have Jesus as your Lord. They say you can be justified, but don't have to have sanctification. They say you can have forgiveness of sin without holiness. Holiness is not important. Forgiveness of sin is important. No, you can't divorce the two, you know. Forgiveness of sin leads to holiness. Justification leads to sanctification. Salvation is something that fulfills the law. If you read the Old Testament, you'll understand your salvation properly. Look at Romans 8, 3. Paul says, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Eh? He condemned sin in the flesh. So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled. Next verse, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. What does it mean to say the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled? That means, what is the righteousness of the law? The Ten Commandments. <laughs> what God did for us in and through Jesus Christ puts us in a position where we'll be able to walk in such a way that we fulfill the righteousness of the law. Amazing truth. I think I want to stop here because already it's time is over. <laughs> I have a few more points, but we'll do that next time when we come. But think about these things. We'll pick it up again as we deal with the next uh, teaching. We'll first deal with this when we come back. I got a few more points, three or four more points to cover, and then we'll go on with the next week's teaching. Let's all stand together, please. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come, we thank you, Lord, for this blessed truth. I pray that you help people to comprehend, understand, digest, and get this in, in their hearts. I pray that there'll be a greater appreciation of the word of God, that we hold in our words, the inspired word of God. The revelation of God is complete in this. So thank you for helping us to understand this, and helping us to appreciate it more than ever, to read it, to benefit from it, 
in a greater way than ever before. That it is in the scriptures will matter to us also as much as it did to Paul. That it is put in the scriptures for us, in the holy scriptures for us. It is written by the inspiration of God to minister to us. And may these words minister to people, take them in the right way and bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.